And we're on! I'm Pixie. I'm Seb. And I'm Pyrosim. And welcome to Nerd Talk. Uh, this evening, uh, Pyrosim is going to be reviewing Trine 2 for us. Uh, we'll be announcing our next giveaway, but first, um, we're giving away a copy of Terraria, so we better draw our winner soonish. Dun, 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 it's the holidays dun, dun, with Nerd dun, Talk, dun, where someone wins. The rest of you, losers. <laughs> And the winner is Kelvin Richard. Woo! Woo! Yay! So congratulations! Getting in contact with you, and we'll send you a copy of Terraria. Enjoy. Yay! Yup, you win stuff. Occasionally, listening to Nerd Talk pays off. Next time, there will be a quiz. Uh, well, next time we're gonna do some other things. Should we get into that first, or should we do that towards the end of the show, or...? That'll be at the end of the show. Yeah. We, we should've planned this better. Um... <laughs> Planning, scripting. Pfft. I do no that sometimes. No time for any of those things. Sometimes. There's no time to explain. No I'm, one, go. Oddly enough, I'm not in charge of either of these contests, so. Right. All right. So it's the holidays around here, and as a result, we have very little time to play games, except for Pixie, who's now playing her copy of The Old Republic. Because I got in on the first day of the early release. Woo. So Yay. her Sith Inquisitioner is already on Inquisitor. her way to... Although someone's already made the Sith Inquisition joke. <laughs> already on her way to dominating the galaxy with lightning and red sticks of lighty death. Does the know. release version seem much different from the testing version? Uh, not really. I haven't, I... Gotten, I haven't gotten very far yet in the, like, actual version. Uh, there's still some... I, like, some visual glitches, enemies, like, you know, dying in midair, like, you know, their body floating, like, several feet above your head type of thing, but... So we're talking the Skyrim level glitches here. It's it's nothing game-breaking, it's just kind of funny. We don't have dragons flying backwards? I've yet to see a dragon. That's, like, really the, the biggest thing that I can point out thus far, though. Like, really, everything else seems to be working okay. Well, I the don't physics have my concerns con you have, I don't think, are even glitches. I think it's just designed to pay very little heed to physics. Uh, but, and um, I'm not far enough yet. I don't have my companion. And so I can't say if that glitch is still there or if they fixed that bug. What, the bug where your companion would just talk and it would always sound like he was speaking directly in your ear, regardless of where he or she was? Uh, no, I'm referring to the one where you went to send your companion to go sell vendor trash, and then they just stand there. Ah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that wasn't a glitch. Maybe that was just your companion being rebellious. Like, no. No, I don't want to go sell your stuff. <laughs> uh, unless Bioware's <laughs> suddenly built a self-aware AI, I doubt it. <laughs> Wouldn't put it past him. Just saying. God, you're weird. A little bit. At any rate... So I'm going to be playing that a lot if you'd like to, I don't know, swing by, say hi to my Sith. Uh, I'm playing on the Ebon Hawk role-playing server. Um, oh good, we do have role-playing servers. Yes, they just didn't have them for testing. So we're not going to deal with, like, Massive Balls 855 running past us as we're trying to go on a quest? It's really self-policed. I was read I, I actually read the terms of the, the EULA and the um, Code of Conduct. There's no actual rules for those. It's just they expect people to, uh, like, police themselves on those servers. Um, but then what's I the have, point of having an RP server? I have run into several <clears throat> Bastillas, Cadens, you know, all the Mary Sue types. Oh, man. I had one guy trying to convince me he was the son of Revan, despite the fact that in this continuity, Revan would have been dead for several hundred years. And is actually like an endgame dungeon to figure out what happened to him. And so, yeah. Oh, and Scourge. I found a Scourge. That's going to get really annoying, but at least it's not Sephiroth. At least there but are not... 400 variations of that name running around. Oh, in general chat, we were trying to speculate on what was going to become the new Goldshire. My guess would be the Sith Academy. Because uh, if I was a, a party full of Jedi looking to raid something to grieve people, I would go to the Sith Academy. Uh, that's not the aspect of Goldshire we were talking about. Gotcha. <laughs> the, the, um, role-playing bits. Gotcha. <laughs> and that inn never looks the same. Yeah. 
All right. I was advised to just look for the half-naked Twilight dancing on a mailbox, and that's how we would know. Thankfully, I don't think you can start with Twi'leks in that area. Yes, you can. Really? Yes, you the can. Inquisitors can be Twi'leks. Yes. And the other thing right. you can do is that characters are actually not locked to their home planet at level one. You're, you are quite free to just get on the shuttle and, and move go. around the starting planets from level one. All right. <clears throat> yeah. So this is going to be fun. And... All right. Well, continuing, tonight we're going to discuss two PC uh, games. So, Pyro, go right ahead. The thing that I reviewed is Trine 2, which came out um, last Wednesday. Pretty new. And it is the sequel to the award-winning Trine 1, which is a puzzle platformer with stunning visuals that was available as part of a humble indie bundle at one point. So probably lots of people have played that. It is a 2D platformer rendered with 3D graphics. Um, lots of visuals that look very hand-painted. Lots of thinking puzzles and a little bit of jumping around, killing goblins. Trine 2 is very much the same as the original. There's a slightly greater variation in puzzles. The combat is pretty much the same. The length is pretty much the same. The visuals are still what they were, which is very good. And that's pretty much it. It is, it is, could nearly be a DLC pack for Trine 1, which is a little disappointing considering it had a fairly long development time and no release date up until like the very last minute. There's a funny saga Frozen Bite, the developer, was like, we'll release it when it's done. Which is, of course, what 3D Realm said about Duke Nukem Forever for 13 years. And then, somewhere in mid-December, they were like, well, yeah, we're gonna release it in December. And then, on like the 7th, they're like, we're gonna release it on the 9th. And then, well, at, at least, least they that's better. That release date. That's better than making fans wait 13 years, I suppose. Yeah. It, it did not have that protracted a development period. But just looking at the graphics, they, they definitely seem to be improved from the original game. I mean, I'm looking at the lighting effects and the, the zoom in and out of the camera, and it's definitely much smoother than the previous game. I don't know. I really didn't notice any particular changes in the graphics. I'm, I'm seeing some, some more detail here. And... It's very appreciated. It's very pretty. Can yeah. we just agree on that? We have it's really freaking pretty. Lots of light bloom. A, a lot more open areas than the previous Trine. There was one puzzle in Trine 2 that involved uh, using a crystal, and you have a wizard who can levitate objects and move them around, and you did have to focus sunlight into a crystal so that it would open a door. That came by very passively, like you're like, hmm, how do I solve this puzzle? And there's this light here, but it looks completely normal because there's all sorts of fancy light and reflections and uh, focusing light through stuff all the time. And so it was kind of a subtle puzzle to solve, but I don't think it was too challenging. The point is that it looks great, and it always has looked great, so if the visuals haven't changed from the original, that's not saying they're bad, because the original was a beautiful game. There are a few specific changes that are interesting. In the first game, the three characters were referred to simply as Wizard, a Knight, and Thief. And they have names in Trine 2 now. The Wizard is named Amadeus, the Thief is named Zoya, and the Knight is named Pontius which seem like appropriate names for those types of things. I think they did have names in the original. It was just referred to mostly in the lore text rather than the gameplay. Because I do remember hearing the name Pontius before for the knight. I'm not sure where I heard it, but I know that was associated with the first game. If they are, they were not in any obvious places because mm -hmm. they, they referred to the characters as knight, wizard, and thief. Yeah. Constantly. When you switched. And during the narrator sections between levels. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. The there's still so, narration between levels, and that discusses the plot. The load times between levels are surprisingly long. It takes like two, two and a half minutes to load a level, but that's not so bad because you'll likely be in a level twenty to thirty minutes. So yeah, two the minutes isn't so bad with screens awesome. gaming. And when you die, it's actually instantaneous to warp back to a checkpoint. There's no loading screen with that. Oh, that's nice. Alright, so let's talk about the core gaming mechanic of Trine as a series. Puzzle so, platformer. Yep, where you will be rotating between one of three characters at any given moment. Your different characters have different abilities, and actually, one of the major draws of Trine is its multiplayer. And just like the original, you can have up to three people playing at the same time, and you can have each person co controlling a character. The special power of the wizard is that he can levitate things and he can summon things. So he can summon boxes and planks, which are very straightforward things. And they joke that he's always trying to learn a fireball spell, but then he can't. Which, that's something you'd expect wizards to be able to do is a very basic skill, but it's not in the game at all. Mm -hmm. The thief's special power is that she has a grappling hook, and so she can grab onto wooden platforms and swing around, and that is very useful for navigating the world. And the knight has practically no special powers. He's good at killing goblins. He has yeah. a sword and a hammer... And he can sometimes break down breakable walls with his hammer. He's a knight. He's big. He takes hits. He hits things. Knight smash! Yeah, what more do you need? He's Interestingly, kind of a... they all have actually the exact same amount of health. The knight is not more durable than the other characters, but he does have a shield that he can use to block damage. Mm -hmm. And so, that works out. Okay. Combat is a bit unnecessary in this game and it's fun enough but you can actually any time you enter a section and there's like goblins start appearing like they, they climb out of the background and the foreground and then you're like hmm there's goblins here and then you can just run past them and ignore them almost always but it, it it's fun to kill them if you want to can you say drop a box on them yes you can nice Another thing about the puzzles is that almost every puzzle can be solved by almost every character. And so there's lots of different ways to get through most things. The This is necessary often because certain characters will die if you like run your wizard into a trap and then your wizard's dead. And then you have only your thief and your knight and you have to figure out how to get past this wall. Not every puzzle is that way, and you can always go back to a checkpoint, which will resurrect all your characters at full health, which is a change from the previous game where you'd only get half health back at a checkpoint. But that doesn't wind up mattering very much because combat is rare, and if you're doing things right, you shouldn't get hit at all. And then... But... If you have a character dead and you don't want to go all the way back to a checkpoint, you can usually solve it with any two or even one characters, as long as the one character isn't the knight because he can't do anything. <laughs> so what you're saying is the person who really can't do anything is just going to keep playing as the knight. <laughs> well, your player sucks, he, is, he will be the knight. If, if you're playing three-player multiplayer, the person who's stuck with the knight is a bit gypped, yes. He just follows along. He's a third wheel. All right then. No, I'm watching a a uh, a gameplay video, and they're specifically using the knight to defend the group. Like, if anything dangerous is happening, they've got the knight going in to swing his sword at things first. And so they just defeated a boss without actually fighting it at all by having the knight destroy the ceiling and drop parts of it on the snake boss. That snake actually cannot be damaged except via that mechanism. The way, the way you fight that boss is you have to stand on a platform that is also part of the structural integrity of the building, and the snake attacks you and bites at you, and then you jump away, but the snake destroys the platform. You do that three times and the ceiling collapses on them. 
Classic. See, oddly enough, the way that this video just defeated it is they had the wizard create a box for the knight to stand on, and then he took swings at the ceiling while standing on top of the box, and it caused the roof to collapse on the snake. Huh. Ta-da! Well, that might so, be possible. Yep. So it looks like we have multiple methods for uh, for defeating bosses, which is always really good game design. I like to see that. That That's true of almost every element in this game. Okay, so, so difficulty-wise, how hard is trying to to beat? The puzzles start pretty easy. Not super easy, but such that you shouldn't have much trouble getting through them. And as you get into the very late levels, they potentially get really, really hard, but the game has a built-in hint system that is triggered by you not progressing for five or ten minutes. You can change in the options how long it will give you before it'll give you a hint. And I never ran into a hint by accident. I was always able to solve the puzzles myself before the problem came up, so it's not too hard. I wouldn't say that I'm super good at puzzles, I'm okay. But it's hard enough, but everybody should be able to complete it without straining themselves. Um, for length, it is about uh, 10 hours long, which is a fair, a fair amount for being a $15 game. What you'd expect from an indie game, mostly. Longer than the campaign of uh, Modern Warfare. True. That is certainly a selling point. Zing. And actually, I'm, does anybody play the single-player campaigns of Modern Warfare? No, Except I'm, for us. I'm pretty so. sure they don't really bother. I think we did. We did for our review, but that that's pretty much it. Yeah, anyway, I remember you were telling me um, about the... Rewards for exploration being different, Pyro? Do you want to get into that a little bit? Yeah. So the straightforward path through this game is a lot like Mario. You start at the left and you run to the right, and sometimes there will be a wall or a door or a monster in your way, and you have to figure out how to get through it. But if you're exploring and you pay attention to up and down, and you pay attention to your puzzles such that you can potentially unlock alternate routes, there are secret rooms that are hidden around. And in the first game, there would be secret rooms that would have treasure chests in them. And those treasure chests would give you artifacts that would give you special abilities, like breathing underwater, or taking extra damage, or being able to summon extra boxes and stuff. Lots of cool and powerful power-ups. In Trine 2, there's the same secret rooms that are hidden in approximately the same way, and they have the same treasure chests in them. But instead of artifacts that give you special gameplay powers, they have collectible paintings and collectible poems in them, which are kind of like super weak sauce. The paintings look nice, and the poems aren't interesting as poems, but they do do some exposition of the plot. And so they're there, and they would be fine if not for the fact that they're not nearly as cool as the upgrades you got in the secret rooms in Trine 1. I suspect this, the reason this is, is that for normalization of puzzle difficulty, because in Trine 1, potentially if you were finding all of the secret rooms, the puzzles would be way easier because you'd have extra abilities. But that seems to make sense to me because if you're, you should get a reward for doing extra work. In Trine nope, 2, this limerick is totally as rule. This limerick is totally as rewarding as godlike power. <laughs> yes. It's totally as rewarding as being able to breathe underwater forever. So You wanted to be a Superman? Nope. Here's a dirty poem. But it's In a Tri dirty One. poem now. Limericks. They're all dirty. I don't think there's any limericks. I think they're all four lines, two couplets. No. Not even a haiku. Nope. No. So, in Trine 1, I actually, after I beat the game, felt compelled to go back through it and collect all the artifacts. I don't envision that I would do that for the collectible paintings and poems. Which is still... oddly enough what they're probably there for. Right. 
Well, they fail at serving for a length extender for the game. Yeah. But I, I don't think that's... I'm disappointed in that, but it's not by any means a deal breaker. I still did hunt for secret rooms just for the pleasure of it, because I'm like, hmm, this looks like a suspicious, different way to solve this puzzle. I wonder if it leads to a secret room. And it does, and then I'm like, yay. Secrets. Oh, you only get the pleasure of thinking you're clever, which is good enough. Good enough for your egomania. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so I guess our final category is trying to fun. It is fun. It's it's very good. There are you don't see many puzzle platformers in the modern age. Is a really popular genre a long time ago, and then it was sort of played out and nobody came back to it. So it's it's pretty much alone in the puzzle platformer genre in 2011. But I thought it was really good. All right. All right. So fifteen dollars. Other, of course, spent. than first-party Nintendo Mario games. So I'm sorry. How much does this retail for? Fifteen dollars. On Steam or PlayStation Network. Um, is this available for the 360 as well? I only know of it being available for PC. It if it is available for other platforms, I will have to look. Okay. We'll find uh, that yeah, out. Yeah, it's, it's PSN and XBLA. Alright, cool. So, no excuse. This is a, a dirt cheap, great game. Alright then. Yay! Alright, now, what did you want to talk about, Sed? I like talking about stuff, but, uh, I don't know, don't we have another game review? Are we doing two game reviews this week, or just the one? As far as I know, just the one, plus the VGAs, plus League. Alright, let's go. So we're doing my thing. Yes. We've got League news. Alright so then. We, we, need anyway. a, we need, like, a segue for that. Like, it has to have lightning. Bzzzt. Good enough! Let's go! <laughs> That's a very, very realistic lightning. That's like lightning that comes out of an electrical outlet. Good enough. So, in League you News this like week... You like my lightning? You can suck it! <laughs> we didn't cover Holy Bear last week, but all, all we have to say is he's a bear, he's free this week, go play him. He's insanely overpowered. He's insanely good, and even after his most recent nerf, I got to play him today, and holy crap, dominated in my first game. Yeah. He's a bear. He bites things. He chases things down, and he beats them. Oh, and throws them. And then throws them into his teammates. What more do you need to know? Yep. So, yeah, next bit of League of Legends news. Yay, Holy Bear. Okay, so unlike most weeks, we are not going to have a Tuesday patch this week for League. It got pushed to Wednesday. The other weird thing is we're also not going to have... It, it doesn't look like at this point we're going to have a Champion Spotlight video for our newest champion who's coming in this week, uh, Ari. The, the Nighttown Fox. Yes. The most Asian-themed character we've got. Because now we're going way into Asian mythology. Actually, right. no, we've got Wukong, too. Yep. Ah, the monkey. But Ari and her first two skins are officially confirmed that they will be coming out tomorrow, December 14th. Just take my money, Riot. Just take it. <laughs> uh, I think they've sold me on this character, too, just looking at her abilities. Like, this is a so really... Pretty. This character has been in development, uh, officially announced since September, and it's really showing in that we've got a unique con uh, collection of abilities that is really showing her to be something cool. Uh, I'm going to pull up her ability list and... Just a second here. Uh, da -da, news. More news for you, us. But Ari is... Welcome to chat, everybody. Yep, welcome to chat, folks. It's good to have you. Ari is going to be a spellcasting, DPS-based character who focuses on mobility and trickiness in her play. So we've got our move list for her. Uh, her passive, Ari charges or gains a, soul, a charge of Soul Eater... Whenever one of her spells hits an enemy, maximum of three charges per spell. Upon reaching nine charges, Ari's next spell has a large amount of spell vamp, 35%. So 35% of the damage that she does on her ninth spell, actually her third spell if she's hitting multiple targets, is going to give her 35% of its damage back as health. Mm -hmm. And on a, on a high yield DPS character, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. If she does a thousand damage, hmm, 
that's 300, uh, 350 health I just got back. Which, uh, for Vayne, that's like a quarter of my health. So I'm imagining Ari's going to have about that level of health. Um, her uh, Q move, Orb of Deception, is kind of like an opposite version of Lux's shield. So she throws out the orb that she carries, and on the way out it deals magic damage to anything it hits. On the way back it deals true damage to the target. So if you're really good at aiming this thing, you're going to be doing double damage, and on the way back, it's going to ignore the enemy's armor. That's brutal. Sounds a lot like Sim's uh, boomerang. Only yeah. uh, better. Except, yeah, true <laughs> damage on the way back. Except it hasn't been nerfed yet. Yeah, no, this, this character's going to take a nerf on week two. I'm already seeing it. Um, her next move... Foxfire is another move that is inspired by another character. Uh, Ari releases three Foxfires, which, after a short delay, lock on and attack enemy uh, nearby enemies. So she spawns mobs? She makes missiles. Ah. She makes seeking missiles. Cool. So this is going to be one of those mechanics that you're going to have to practice with to get it to land, because there is a short delay between her dropping them and them actually attacking a target. But this will be one thing that really charges her soul eater quickly. Because mm -hmm. it's going to guarantee three hits, which three of those and you've charged it. Mm -hmm. um, her next move is kind of going to be her signature move. This is what a lot of people are going to be afraid of her for. Charm. Ari blows a kiss that damages and charms an enemy it encounters. So it's going to be a skill shot. Uh, attack, hitting the first target it con uh, connects with. And this is proven that it can hit minions causing them to walk harmlessly towards her. So not only are you doing damage to the enemy, but you've also disabled them and made them walk towards you and possibly the rest of your team without I'm attacking. Turret. Yeah, without doing any damage to you. So she basically just goes, Yoo-hoo! Come here. Yeah, and then watches them you. walk to their deaths. I'm wondering how the kiss does damage. And then Ari's ultimate, which, IP style. <laughs> Ari's ultimate, which is kind of uh, my favorite thing that she does. Ari, uh, it's called Spirit Rush. Ari dashes forward and fires Essence bolts, damaging three nearby champions. This doesn't target minions. Spirit Rush can be cast up to three times before it goes on cooldown. Dang. So she will hit nine champions with this move that causes her to dash forward incredibly quickly. It is a great escape mechanism. It is a great mechanism for rushing around a team fight without getting hit, and for doing damage. Used properly, Ari is going to be a monster mm -hmm. who is just going to dominate team fight team fights and her lane. She's definitely going to be a solo mid character. The only thing I'm seeing that could hold her back is enemy champions with long stuns or snares. So. Rise. Rise and Annie will be trouble for her. Mm -hmm. But, in a situation where she's got something protecting her, a tank for instance, or a turret, she's going to be a monster. She's going to just dominate every situation that comes up. Uh, yeah, th th this is a day one buy for me. I'm thinking for me too. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I love this character aesthetically. Uh, I'm going to link, link the uh, news article about her in chat. Maybe just a second. Uh, here we go, and paste. There we go. So that's that's Ari's main skin. We know that she is also being released with Midnight Ari, which I'm imagining is a, a black-based skin, and Dynasty Ari, which is probably a, kind, a formal wear kind of thing. Because we've seen other Dynasty skins before. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the heavily Chinese-influenced skins. Mm -hmm. Alright, we've also had the announcements of the festival skins! Yay! Because what's a holiday without new skins? And so, you know, the winter skin is out on the playing field. And Flutterkai, you actually got this one, got one of these uh, predicted right. Right? Like, he's been talking about this for weeks, and, and I've said I've, I'd like to see it, but I was waiting for the inevitable disappointment. But no, Christmas tree Maokai! We have festival Maokai, who literally is a tree. I've got the picture for it. I have found the pictures of the new art so we can check these out and i will link this splash art in chat just a second here we go and 
Done. All right. So first up is Christmas tree Maokai. Who's he literally like a present? Maokai is a Christmas tree with exploding presents. He's got like the star, and is that a ribbon? Yep, that is a ribbon. So, and his his tree arm now has a Santa hat on it. So yeah, that's adorable. I love the idea that his little saplings are now going to be little explosive packages. <laughs> All right, next up on the list we have. Uh, I'm trying to find the exact name of it. Toy Soldier Gangplank. It's Gangplank as a cute pirate toy. And so you can see, like, the very obvious, like, joints. Yep. He has articulated joints. And no crotch. <laughs> Poor Gangplank. Did you want them to put one on there? <laughs> no. No, I don't want that. And next up, we've got one that I'm sure Pyro's going to be all kinds of excited for. Snowmerdinger. Snowmerdinger? Snowmerdinger. <laughs> it is a... Blink. It is a Frosty the Snowman... Heimerdinger, who has candy cane turrets. Well, I can get behind that. Like, this is adorable. His little frosty mustache. Yeah, this is a neat character. I, I really like this snow skin. And finally, last on the list, because we always need a sexy female holiday outfit. <sighs> this one isn't so bad, to be honest. Like, this is more clothed than the normal version of this character. Sad that that's true, did, but... Did you have to say it, though? <laughs> we have Mistletoe LeBlanc. Who actually looks ridiculously cool. So, cape and a miniskirt. Ta-da! Cape, miniskirt, um, thigh highs. Uh, I like the hood, actually. I think that's a cool line. detail. And a nice new staff. So yeah, not a bad character overall. I've, I've definitely seen a lot worse. Like I, I hated the uh, the witch Nidalee that they put out for Halloween this year. Mm -hmm. I thought that was lousy, but uh, that's actually really good. Mm -hmm. Like I could see using that skin on normal circumstances because I'm not a big fan of the standard LeBlanc skin. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like her Cruella de Vil skin. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And I like her magician skin just because I'm a big Zatanna fan, and that's pretty much what that is. But, like, that's a nice basic skin. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact Flutterkai is uh, planning on getting the, uh, the Maokai. And I'm willing to bet Pyro's going to end up with Snowmerdinger. But, like, I'm not really a LeBlanc player, but I would consider getting that before the, uh, the holiday is up. Now, question, can you continue to use the holiday skins after the holiday season? You can over? use it any time. So I, I'm, like, imagining somebody being a douche and running around with, like, Christmas tree Maokai in July. You know he's going to. Um, yeah, if you buy the skin, you can use it any time. It's just the times that you can buy it are limited. Mm -hmm. And they still haven't announced if whether last year's skins are going to become available again, because they put out holiday skins last year. They had a... Uh, a Reindeer Kogma and Silent Night Sona mm -hmm. that actually had a special interaction together. If they both did their, I believe it was Slash Dance together, mm -hmm. they would sing a Christmas carol at the same time. And it was only if they both did it together at the same time. Alright then. So I'm hoping that the same thing happens this year. Nifty. Alright, continuing the patch notes. We got a list of buffs and nerfs that I want to go through quickly. Like, very quickly. We can watch this. Um, Fizz. Nerfed. He was too powerful. He was killing dudes faster than they wanted him to. Cassadin. Buffed. His ultimate is now on an even shorter cooldown. Oh wait, nope. Sorry. Cooldown increased. Nerfed. Ha! Can't run now. Sucker. Um, Lux. Buffed. Her cooldowns have been lowered, and her prismatic barrier is much better. Misfortune, buffed. Because she needed it. Now I'm actually afraid of getting shot with bullet time. <sighs> Look, you can just run through that and not bother if the slow wasn't going to kill you. Mordekaiser. <laughs> Mordekaiser, buffed, because he needed it. Guy's next to useless. Um, Pantheon, buffed, because no one uses him. Sivir. Nerfed and buffed. Boomerang Blade got uh, worse. Ricochet got better. Sona. Nerfed. 
Don't know why. She really didn't deserve that. All right. Trundle. Fixed, because he's been broken since Volibear came into the game. Trindamir. Nerfed, because he needed it. Trindanoob. Suck it, noobs. Like calling him. Yeah, he doesn't heal as well anymore with his I have a free heal because I've been hitting things. Like he always does. Mm -hmm. Twisted Fate. Buffed to the point where I actually want to play him again. He has better ranged, and now his pick a card actually requires you to trigger it instead of him just throwing the card that you pick the next time he does an auto attack. Which was dumb, because chances are I'd hit a minion with it. <laughs> uh, Udir. Nerfed because dodge is no longer in the game. So, kind of? Yeah, you're no longer going to be shooting him and having hit the I didn't hit, I didn't hit, I didn't hit come up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Udyr's dumb. Vigar, buffed to actually be playable again. He's had all of his mana cost lowered. Volibear! Nerfed because he needed it. <laughs> Nerfed again. Needed it. Had it coming. Uh, Zin, buffed. His, uh, his Crescent Sweep armor has been increased. I have no problem with that. Alright, and that's all the champion changes. Yep, that's all the champions. Um, in general, dodge has now been removed from the game. Because people decided that wasn't fun. Right? And Warmog's armor has been nerfed in general because it was way too good. So yeah, that's a thing. Um, trying to see what else. There's a couple of adjustments to the masteries, so you might have to reset your trees. Again. But beyond that, the only other major fix is that on Dominion, uh, any character that has a zombie state, so when Karthus goes in his dead mage form, when Kogma is getting ready to explode, or when Yorick comes back from the dead, uh, the character's respawn timers now reset after that state ends, rather than when the state begins. So it's not like they're getting a couple extra seconds of play. Mm-hmm after they died and still come back early. Yeah. I can see how that'd be broken. Yeah, that needed to happen. Plus, the most exciting thing this patch, the winter map is back! Yeah, we've mentioned that. I'm so happy! It's so pretty! Like, I love the winter map. It was so awesome. And the first game I played on it, I was Voli Bear. It was like, I'm a bear, and it's in the snow. I'm a happy polar bear. But yeah. As opposed to like what the the summer map where it's just you know I'm a sad polar bear because it's global warming. I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> Fizz is gonna look so ridiculous on the winter map. With shark. Who's a cold fishy? But yeah, um, I don't know. This patch comes out tomorrow, and I am totally looking forward to it. Ari is definitely looking like a day one purchase for me. Yeah. We also have a new list of runes that came out that you can check on the website, or are coming out. And, uh, like, we're, we're now going to have the spell vamp runes, the hybrid armor magic penetration runes, so characters that do both things now don't have to pick between one or the other. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to play a hybrid character, like, oh, I don't know, Sivir, she can now actually have both armor and magic penetration for her abilities. Um, we're also going to have the spell vamp runes added, so characters like uh, half the cast who use ability points will actually be able to build some spell vamp in for their level one uh, builds mm -hmm. using their rune pages. Oh, it's just giving more options to players, and I think that's a great thing. So yeah, League continues to be exciting. More PC right. gaming news. There's a new Humble Indie bundle out, and it is actually a numbered one. And not Man. just a weird one that has one game in it. This They're one actually really has getting into that. The seven games in it, which is a large number, and they are hard hitters. Pretty, pretty good games. The full list. Well, I, I'm not even going to give you the full list because you can just look at it at humblebundle.com. But the list that is interesting to me is Cave Story. Cave Story is a huge and famous game that was. A that free one, game for a stop? long time. Pyro, I think we should probably clarify. Uh, gratuitous Space Battles and Cave Story 
um, you only get for paying up above the average. Amount. Right, I, I was going to get to that, but... And that's sort of disappointing to me, because uh, I, I really liked the idea of people paying legitimate amounts because they wanted to, and if they were poor, they didn't have to. And Cave Story... You still get a lot, though, if you, you don't yeah, that You still much. get five games, and five pretty good games for potentially nearly free. Yeah. But Cave Story is probably worth paying above the average. And of course, mm -hmm. it is a good cause because charity and indie developers and DRM free and cross-platform, all things that you want to support. But, you know, sometimes you can't afford ramen. Likewise, there is also Super Meat Boy on here, which is critically acclaimed, well-established, like... This is worth more than $5 for this one game alone, and you still get so much more with this. Anyway, you were talking about Cave Story. Cave Story is probably the oldest and most famous game on this list, and it started its life as a free game by a Japanese developer named Pixel, and that got a fan translation that was also free, and is probably still available for free on the internet, that is very famous. Probably you will run into people who have played it and you didn't even know about it. It is a platformer that involves shooting things, no puzzles really, but a really intricate and interesting story. Heavily narrative driven, a lot like a Metroid game in terms of actual gameplay. Literally, as you said that, the video that Sen was watching had Evoke's classic Metroid come up on the screen. There you go. <laughs> it's completely unplanned. Yeah, so if this you looks want, like if you a want really a great platformer. With an excellent story, Cave Story is the one to play. You, you definitely need to play it. I'm going to give that an unqualified good review. Um, right. Other games on this list that I've already owned, which is... The other disappointing thing about this is that I already own one, two, three, four of these games. Which, out of seven, I guess, still isn't bad. But Jamestown is an incredibly good bullet hell. And bullet hell is a very specific genre that you maybe won't enjoy unless you enjoy the genre. But Jamestown is a good instance of it. You fly a spaceship, and you shoot, and you dodge bullets. And there's nothing more to say about it, but it's good. Bit Trip Runner is a very, very simple game. It's basically like playing Simon Says with music. But it's good music, and, you know, Simon Says. Yeah, I'm just currently watching the video for Jamestown, and this looks ridiculous. But that's the that's the thing behind Bullet Hell. Like this looks even hard for a Bullet Hell fan. Um. Well, the thing about Jamestown is actually there's like six or seven difficulty levels, and so if you're if you're new to the genre, you can get started very easy. And the easiest setting is anybody could beat it. And then you can adjust your difficulty as you please to find the level that you enjoy the most. Ooh, the bundle also includes the Jamestown soundtrack. Cool, and that is a good soundtrack. We also have Shank. I have never even heard of it prior to seeing it in this bundle. It really looks like... It looks like Dishwasher almost. Yeah, it looks like the Dishwasher meets Evil Dead. Lots of blood. Yes. Yeah. All of the blood. He punched out all my blood. All right, let's check out this gratuitous space battles because I get this. Probably space. exactly what it sounds like. Players outfit a complete fleet from bulkheads to munitions. It reminds me of a two D version of Homeworld. All right then. But hey, at a pay what pay what you want um, style, the the humble bundle. No arguing that it's a successful method. And I think the average that you need to pay over is like a little over five bucks. So 
You have to currently pay $5.17 to claim all of the games. Yeah, so whoop dee doo It was pay more than five seventeen, so pay five eighteen. Yep. And money will go to benefit the American Red Cross and Child's You can Child choose Life to have charity. it do those. It's, you, you can split it however you want. Yup. You can give it all to the developers, you can give some to the developers and some to those charities, you can give it all to those charities. One thing I'm kind of disappointed about, and I don't think that's new in this Humble Bundle, is they swapped out the Electronic Frontier Foundation with the American Red Cross. And I guess I'm not terribly disappointed because the American Red Cross is a, a wonderful organization and deserves money, but I, I, I like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and I'm disappointed to see they're missing. Probably because that's fairly political of an organization, and mm -hmm. they don't want to scare off Republicans. But, um, there's also one more game, which is Night Sky HD, and I've never heard of this game before, but it is listed as being from the same developer as Cave Story on the Humble Bundle page, which here is Nicleus and not Studio Pixel. So... If it is a, just a different name for Studio Pixel, that is very reputable. And if it is the person who translated it, then I guess that doesn't mean anything at all. But it mm -hmm. is probably good. Cave Story guessing. is excellent, and it's listed as being from the same developer. More gaming news. The Spike TV Video Game Awards were this week. And uh, the first thing to say about this is, as gamers, and I think I can speak for all three of us on this podcast, we somewhat resent having Spike TV as our representative. Somewhat resent, completely hate. <laughs> because Spike TV yeah. is garbage. Yes. But yeah. it is a Pick, thing that happened. Pick showed me something on Spike that I had been purposely avoiding watching, in fact, had completely blotted out of my memory that this thing existed, that just made me cringe. Like, I've clicked through Spike every now and then, because, like, the idea of the, the deadliest warrior sounds interesting. But when you're watching a show that's like, yes, we fed this data into our computer simulator, and here's the results, that's not a computer simulator. That's two actors fighting in a field. I, I showed him Mansers also before the show started. That is... And th that's enough to make you want to kill yourself. So yes, oh. Spike TV is horrible. The, the VGA is potentially not being quite as horrible as Mansers, but that not setting a very high bar. It's also, they're, they're, they're... Did anybody at that award ceremony even know who Miyamoto was? It didn't seem like it. Nope. It's, it's, it's an embarrassment because you have all these people who aren't involved in the industry in any way just because they're famous par parading around. It's, it's, it's essentially one long commercial. Or rather, a long series of commercials. I'm, I'm really thinking the only reason anyone watches the VGAs... Is for the trailers. Yeah, is so that they can watch trailers of what's coming out. You know, G4 used to have a show dedicated to that. I loved that show. I don't remember what it was called. But I think I it was just trailers or something. Cinematech. Like, yeah. Cinematech. That was a great show. I want that show to still exist. Too bad. I would like anything game-related to still exist on G4. <laughs> and an episode of right? X-Play that occasionally talks about games in between, like, intern jokes. Uh, no, actually, they basically took out all the jokes, and that's what makes it not funny anymore. Right. So yeah, I I would like a decent award show for games, but I really question who's gonna watch it? Like, on, on standard TV, like, if they internet broadcast it, yeah, I get it. People would tune in. People would watch this online. But there's... Most gamers, I think, don't really watch TV. I don't. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, I don't see the draw of why they would do this on a network. And, and like, Spike gets that fact, and so for the most part, they 
they broadcast for the people who are probably already watching their network to begin with. And then the gamers tune in for the trailers. It's... Of course, the first thing we learn in broadcasting school is it's all about the Benjamins, but... Yeah. And they seem to be doing that pretty well, don't you think? Yeah. It, 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 just, it just hurts me in my heart place. That, so, you know, but the, the, this is juvenile. The whole of the internet has already complained about the VGAs, so I guess we can move on and just talk about their, their nominees. The awards don't have this much is a waste of my time. creative I integrity, which is to say, I wouldn't assume that a game is good because of the awards, but the awards do represent what games sell well. So yep. if, if you want to know what were the best sellers of the year and what other people are likely to know about if you want to be able to talk about games at the company water cooler, the VGA's list is a reasonable list to look at. It's yeah, by... By no means is this the brilliant, all-encompassing list of what is great in gaming. Because, well, frankly, there are online sites that do that better. Like, I, I will respect GameSpot's yearly Game of the Year award, because they really think about that. They, it's not always just what game sold the best, it's usually what game pushed the industry the furthest forward. Like, last year's winner was uh, uh, Dark Souls. Or not Dark Souls, what's the previous one? Um... I can't remember the name of the game. Not Dark Souls, Dark... Demon Souls? Demon Souls. Thank you. Yeah, it was Demon Souls. Not exactly, like, the best-selling game, not a perfect game, but a game that actually tried something unique. So, I guess we can... Do we want to talk about the, the Spike Oh, hey, winners? I've got an actually... The wiki actually has a more comprehensive list. I'm going to go with this instead. All right. So, like, so there, there were a couple awards that I really respect. I, I do have a problem with their overall winner in that it's a very flawed game that has only been out for a month. All right. So we'll go from the top down then? Sure. Um, the winner was, well... Game of the year? Skyrim. Um, the other nominees were Batman Arkham City, The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, Portal 2, and Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception. Like, I, I get that Skyrim is a good game, we recommended it, but it's also really flawed, and a lot about the experience that you craft yourself in this game. Maybe that's what makes a good game, though. I, that's I had an amazing subjective. I had an amazing time with two of the nominees that I would outrank Skyrim. Like, I had a much better time playing Arkham City and Portal 2 and playing the experience that the game creators made for me. It is. I am a bit disappointed that Skyrim came out so recently, because to give a Game of the Year award to somebody, I'd like to have a bit more time and space on the issue. But I think if you asked me to pick right now, I probably would have picked Skyrim as Game of the Year for myself. Well, I can definitely say it was an improvement over Oblivion, and the best Elder Scrolls since Morrowind. Oh, so man. It, it's, it's not a bad game. Portal 2 is stark competition for Game of the Year, though. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, Portal and I, 2 I do is, disagree with this next one here. As, as I see it, Portal 2 is a perfect game. I cannot find a flaw in that game. It's really good. Anyway, Studio of the Year, Bethesda won for Skyrim. And I disagree with this. I feel like Valve should have taken this one, at least. I disagree with even that. I think that Mojang deserves Studio of the Year. I'm, I'm picking from the nominees, okay? Okay, the nominees were Naughty Dog for Uncharted 3, Rocksteady for Batman Arkham City, and Valve for Portal 2, and then Bethesda won. Um, no. I still feel it's Mojang that deserves this. I'm trying to pick from the list here, but oh, okay. okay. <laughs> like, the studio that went from one guy to releasing a full game product while letting people constantly beta test for them, and then essentially release the game for free to the people who'd already betaed it, that's, that's really impressive. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I can agree with that. But, like I said, I was 
making my pick on the basis of the nominees that were already in front of me. Yeah. Anyway, character... Beth Bethesda just proves that if you have enough money thrown at you, you can craft your own world. Character of the year. I... Uh, I'm a bit confused by this one, to be honest, because this character existed in the previous iteration of the game. Like, the character of the year is the Joker from Batman Arkham City. One, not a game character. Comic character. Two, not a new iteration of this character. He's the same character he was in Arkham Asylum. Mm. He's the same character he was in Batman the Animated Series. But I'm sure Hamma was very happy. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> the other characters were Nathan Drake, who is every Nolan North character. Marcus Phoenix from Gears of War 3. Also the same character from the previous Gears of War. They just focused more on character in this game. And the only new character, Wheatley from Portal 2. <laughs> Yay, Wheatley. I, I, di I did like Wheatley. I could think of a lot better nominees for best character. Like, seriously, this year, there were a lot of good characters that came out in games. Mm -hmm. Like, I I really liked Monkey from uh, from Enslaved. Yep. I thought he was really cool. Was that this year? That was this year. Oh, God, it feels like so long ago. <laughs> no, I, I really liked Monkey. Um, I really liked Chuck Green from, uh, from Dead Rising 2. Um... God, there were so many good gaming characters this year. It, it's ridiculous to think that a comic book character had to win it. All right. I'm, I want to go back a little bit because you were talking about Mojang, and mm -hmm. the winner of the Best Independent Game Award was Minecraft. And uh, Was that I really a contest? <laughs> it was technically released this year. I really feel like Minecraft is last year's game. It, it, yeah. It, it did all the stuff it did last year mm -hmm. and and the, the only thing the release did is put a stamp on it that said okay i'm released now with not really any important differences and so i i sort of resent the independent games that re were released this year that might have been stomped on by minecraft because that should have been last year's award mm -hmm. at least it wasn't something that popcap put out because they're not independent anymore popcap to call PopCap independent, even for, like, the past five years, is fairly insane. Because when you have but, that much money, but you're not independent. But do it! So, anyway, I don't think we, we really need to do the... Um, okay, the system awards really make me laugh, because the 360 one isn't an exclusive at all. And the yeah. two exclusives that are out for that platform, Forza and Gears of War 3, didn't get it. That's yeah. just funny to me. So I think we can skip over the console-specific ones. Like, at least the other consoles' winners were exclusives. I, uh, I, that's something that can be said. I would like to make an interesting semantics note, which is, if the titles of the Best Platform Game Awards are Best PC Game, Best 360 Game, and Best Wii Game... and <laughs> I how think we just... We just either proved how bad the Wii lineup was this year, or just how desperate they were for nominees, or I guess how badly the, the judges fail at actually playing Wii games. Because we're... Give me a second to read the Wii nominees. Okay. Bottom up. <laughs> Bottom up. Lost in Shadow. So, Lost in Shadow was a game that was actually released for other systems, if I'm correct. Like, that, that was a DLC game for the other systems. I'll find out and just say... But we had nothing else to nominate for it? Da, 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 da. Let's see, where is it? My, my semantic concern was going to be that how can a game on a platform that the game of the year came out on be no, the best game on that platform? Okay. Shouldn't the game of year have been the best game on that platform? I suppose you have a semantics point. Okay, so the next we was... Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Okay, Kirby, good series, known franchise, excellent gameplay. The next one up is Epic Mickey. Which we hated, by Are the way. Are you really telling me that nothing else of value came out for the Wii this year that Epic Mickey got on the list of best Wii game? Uh, I, I can't stress to you enough how much we hated every second playing that game. But this is proof that the only thing that comes out on the Wii 
our freaking first party games, which there weren't many this year because Nintendo's already shot that load into, into the world, and freaking party collections. And so Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword took it. Skyward Sword like wins it. by merit of being the only good game on the platform this year. Exactly. I disagree with that wholeheartedly, but my winner didn't even get nominated. What would you have nominated? I'm sorry. I really like No More Heroes 2. Ah. I, I also didn't realize that was this year. It's That feels like a year ago as well. But Actually, that might have been last year now that I think about it. We can look this up. Alright, back to Wikipedia. To Wikipedia we go! Who's faster? Faster with the wiki. Is it Pixie? Is it Pyro? Pyro's probably looking up something completely unrelated. Da, 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 da. 2010! Yep, see? That was a year ago. Okay, so that couldn't have been nominated. Told you. Wow, the Wii. So sad. Portal 2 takes best PC game. Durr. Not surprised. Let's All right, see. so best action adventure, Arkham City. Wait, what? We're not gonna, surprised. We're gonna skip best shooter. Is there really a question there? Yeah. Okay. Hey, it's Spike TV. Call of Duty wins best shooter. Also, cats are felines. <laughs> the world is unsurprised. Best handheld mobile game, Super Mario 3D Land. Nobody is surprised. You know, at so, least it wasn't Angry Birds. Although I think that's also last year. That that's. Pretty old, yeah. Best multiplayer. Okay, the fact that Call of Duty didn't win this makes me laugh really hard. Portal 2 wins best multiplayer. And EA and Activision cry that their category was stolen from them. Yeah, by the 3, nerds. Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 3, and Gears of War 3 all made the nominee list. And all lost to Portal 2. The science nerds won the Spike VGAs. Alright, so continuing. Best individual sports game. This is a category. Like, really? Okay, don't care. Fight night, whatever. Moving on. Best sports game, NBA 2K12. Hey, it's a sport with a number in front or behind it. Uh, best RPG, Skyrim. Best driving game, Forza Motorsport. Uh, can't say I'm surprised. Deus Ex was on the list for best RPG, but it also wasn't that good. Yeah. Like, like Dragon Age 2 and Dark Souls were also on the nominee list for Hey, you uh, want RPG. replayability in your game? No, just load the ending again. Click a different button. Okay, that's somewhat unfair, because the ending of Human Revolution was really dumb, but the whole game was really good. I mean, The whole game was really good until you hit the last five minutes, which just completely shot itself in the foot. What's my last boss? Oh, a crazy lady that plugged herself into a machine that had nothing to do with the plot up until now. No, actually, even the last boss made sense. It's just after you defeat the last boss, and it's like, well, choose your ending cutscene. That was incredibly stupid. That was, that, enough was just... to, that was enough to kill my wanting to keep the game. I, I feel like the game had a lot of merits to make up for that single very stupid aspect. It angered me enough to return the game. I like shooting things. <laughs> I like stealthing past things and then hacking other things to shoot them for me. Yeah, except that kind of killed you when it came to the boss fight, so ha ha! Yeah, but, but IDOS made it okay by going, we outsourced those! That doesn't make it any easier for you sneaky stealthy people. Look, we had nothing to do with the boss fight. Get this guy. Like, that was the most awkward video ever. That one guy from that company that was outsourced to do the boss fight desperately trying to explain what he was thinking. Anyway, best driving game, Forces Motorsport 4. Because um, we didn't have Gran Turismo this year. Uh, up against Dirt 3, Driver San Francisco, and Need for Speed The Run. No Trackmania 2? No. Nope. Fine. Best fighting game. Uh, the nominees were uh, WWE All-Stars. Is that even a fighting game? I guess, technically. King of Fighters 13. Yup. Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and the winner... What a beta that was. Mortal Kombat. At least Mortal Kombat was a finished game? <laughs> like, I can't, I can't argue at this point that Marvel vs. Capcom 3, as much as I love it, is a finished game. 
We're missing. <laughs> we're missing a reliable uh, multiplayer. We're missing lobbies where you can actually spectate a fight. We're missing six characters that were supposed, or sorry, twelve characters that were supposed to be in there. Um, we're still missing that like adventure mode that they've said was coming. Like, yeah, I'm sorry, Marvel vs. Capcom Three isn't a game. It's a beta, a beta that costs forty dollars. Best motion game. I can't believe we're doing this. That's a category? Were there even any other nominees than Skyward Sword? What else would uh, even yeah. be eligible? Just Dance 3? Okay, no, Dance I'm 3. sorry. Dance Masters, which we watched at Gen Con this year, should have won this category, because that's the first, like, dancing simulator that uses the Kinect that actually looks like people are dancing. As opposed to, get off my lawn. As opposed to, I'm making weird motions in front of this machine, like... Watching the, the Dance Masters people play on the other side of the fighting games where we were playing, they looked like they were actually doing the dance moves and having fun. That looked like a great game. Too bad because um, they didn't even make the nominees list. The nominees were Child of Eden, Dance Central 2, and The Gun Stringer. I don't even know what that last one is. Uh, I haven't heard of it either. He's a guy um, who ties guns on strings. <laughs> See, I know the first two were Connect games. Watch the gun stringers like some Wii game. And no, another Connect game. So it was a Wii game against three Connect games, and somehow Connect lost. Which is surprising, because I've heard nothing complaints about Skyward Sword's motion controls. Minecraft takes best independent game uh, up against yeah, Bast what was it up against? Bastion, uh, Super Brothers, Sword and Sorcery EP, uh, and the Binding of Isaac. I'm sorry, Bastion deserved that one. Like, Bastion really deserves it because Minecraft is last year's game. And, and just the story behind Bastion that the guy who's the head of the studio used to be a reviewer for GameSpot who sat down one day and literally went, what do I want to play? And made Bastion. It is a great story of how a game comes out. Minecraft already got its, like, Okay, I'm sorry, year worth of fame. It got more than 15 minutes. There's not a gamer who doesn't know what Minecraft is, and most of them have bought it. Bastion did get some comeuppance, though, in that it won Best Downloadable Game, but my semantic concern rears its head again, because... How... Isn't everything a download at this point? Well, especially Minecraft, because, okay, Bastion and Minecraft are independent games, is Minecraft less of a downloadable game than Bastion? You can't go to a store and buy Minecraft. The only maybe, way to get it is downloadable. Maybe that's how they just try to, like, balance things. I, 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 they're like board titles that don't mean anything? <laughs> yeah, they're like, no, we're I, sorry that we bo you both can't win Best Independent because no, Minecraft I, came I, out. I think this all comes back to, this is Spike TV, and they don't know what the hell they're right. doing. They don't even care, and they haven't played these games. They're just looking at the sales lists. Anyway, so, Best Adapted Video Game. I really find it hard to believe that that's a Category 2. But adapted, it's, the, it's, so it's the, this isn't an original IP. We're, we're sorry that this is not original content, this isn't actually a, a normal game, so here's your award. Uh, so Batman Arkham City takes that, it was up against Back to the Future, the game, Captain America Super Soldier, and Lego Star Wars 3, the Clone Wars. I'm sorry, anytime you have a word and Lego Star Wars in the category, you've completely just blown up the point of it. What if the award is Best Lego Star Wars Game? <laughs> then there will be a grudge match like you wouldn't believe between fanboys for whatever miscellaneous IP they picked up. Um, <clears throat> dude, there's like a six Lego Star Wars games, aren't and I, there? And I'm least? sorry when it's Star Wars fans beating Potter fans in the head. That's just popcorn no, he right said there. Best Lego Star Wars Game, not Best Lego Game. Oh, okay. Well, you could have that category then. Anyway, uh, best song in a game. Also a BS category. One of the bits from Bastion, actually. Build that wall. I must say that I don't. I wish there were better categories. There's there's two categories that I really want to see and think are plausible. One that you know? Bastion should have win one is best new mechanic, which would probably be Bastion's narration. And best screenplay, which Bastion might also have contended for. I, 
well, one, that they're not doing this right to begin with, and two, uh, at least this is an original song. Last year, I don't know if you remember from the VGAs, the best song in a game was a Green Day song from Rock Band. That is an excellent point. That's hard. This at least is My part heart of... is broken anew that you remind me of that. that, that this, year... this at least was part of an original freaking score. Yeah, this is at least best original song in a game, because we've, we've actually got Want You Gone on this list. Um, another Bastion song? Enough, enough, two Bastion songs. Two Portal songs, actually. Because we've got one of the, the techno tracks from Portal. Uh, and one of the Dragon songs Age from Dragon Age songs. 2, which I can't say I've ever played any Dragon Age 2, so... Because yeah. I didn't like Dragon Age Origins, so... Yeah. Best original score. Actually, this was one of the categories I would give to Human Revolution. Like, I... Between... This was actually a, a solid category with a lot of competition. Yeah. Bastion, an incredible soundtrack. Which one? Arkham City... Very good soundtrack. A little too inspired by The Dark Knight. Yeah. Um, Deus Ex Human Revolution. Amazing cyberpunk soundtrack. Like, if I'm ever running a Shadowrun game in the future, I will be using that soundtrack. If it wasn't encoded on a Blu-ray disc and therefore inaccessible to me. I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> Burn. And Portal 2 also had a good soundtrack. Fantastic soundtrack. Best graphics? Why is this a thing? You know, they could have just said technical award. Uh, or I would have liked a best aesthetics award. Or best visuals. That would have been good. Yeah. Yeah. But why Uncharted 3, where the visuals are gray and brown Indiana Jones? Like, I don't get that. So Uncharted 3 wins. It was up against Batman Arkham City, which is also gray. Uh, L.A. Noir. Which had really great that facial really animation. really good um, aesthetically. And Rage, which. Which was brown and gray. It's the Brown and Gray Awards. <laughs> I guess. Uh, best performance by a human male. Okay, I'm. F I will still laugh that they had to qualify human. Except he wasn't playing a human. Nope. Uh, Stephen Merchant is Wheatley from Portal Two. Uh, up against J.K. Simmons is Cave Johnson from Portal Two. Mark Hamill as the Joker in Batman Arkham City, and Nolan North as Nathan Drake in Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception. Nolan North as every Nolan North role. <clears throat> so, yeah. I, I gotta give it. Stephen Merchant totally earned that. Like, Wheatley is charming and funny and threatening and scary all at the same time. Mm -hmm. He does a fantastic job. And as much as I utterly love Mark Hamill's Joker... And as much as, you know, we also enjoyed uh, J.K. Simmons' Cave Johnson. Yeah, that, that is one of the few hard-fought categories where I 100% agree with where they were going. Mark Hamill, I love you, but Stephen Merchant earned that. Uh, best performance by a human female, Ellen McLean as GLaDOS. That was also pretty well earned. Who I talks think. through a synthesizer? Still, she delivers. She de makes a solid delivery on those lines. Yeah, glad that, that is, that is a, one of those very memorable performances that is going to stick with you for years. She puts so much context and meaning behind every pause, every little delay, every slight twinge of sarcasm. Yeah, that that is an earned uh, performance. Yeah. <clears throat> um, up against nominees uh, Claudia Leck as Chloe Frazier in Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception, another Uncharted character, Emily Rose as Elena Fisher, and Tara Strong as Harley Quinn in Batman Arkham City. Another really great performance that I'm sorry, but Portal 2's voice acting wins. Like Also, that was a weak character. I'm sorry, I love Harley, but that was, that was it, very... It was a weak done. version of Harley, but I don't think that was Tara Strong's fault. No, that wasn't her fault, but it like, certainly wasn't going to help her win this. She... I, I like her as much as the original voice actress for Harley. I know they couldn't get her back, mm -hmm. and so Tara Strong was, was the next thing that they could get. She did a fantastic job. with Within what she had to work with, yeah. Yeah. It, it is a but, very hard role, and fans were, were not looking forward to that performance, but she did an excellent job with mm -hmm. it. And she earns recognition for that, but when you're up against uh, GLaDOS and Portal 2, like... Sorry, just take it back. GLaDOS has d done two games worth of awesome. <clears throat> it is going to be hard to beat. Tara Strong, I totally look forward to seeing everything she can do in the future. I'm going to skip over Best Downloadable Game because we already had this conversation. Best DLC, do we really... I, that, 
Why is that a thing? And why is Arrival on there? And Arrival was terrible. I didn't think it was terrible, but it wasn't the best. No, the the best Mass Effect DLC without a doubt was, well, in from my perspective, uh, I really liked Overlord. Mm-hmm. Like, Overlord was just awesome. I don't know if that was this year. <laughs> no, that was last year. Yeah, but, so that doesn't... But seriously, when you're up against Freddy Krueger in Mortal Kombat... Like, no. So anyway, Portal 2, peer review, wins best DLC, up against Fallout New Vegas, Old World Blues, Mass Effect 2's Arrival, and Mortal Kombat's Freddy Krueger. Yeah, I'm sorry, can we skip the next category, because most anticipated game is bullshit. Well, there we go, there's the the explicit tag right there. Who paid the most for marketing? Moving on! Uh, (laughs) Also, next category, also bullshit. Trailer of the year. I don't know, that seems legit. Trailers. Who had the best advertising campaign? Really? Trailers are a cinematographical creation. I mean, if, if TV shows and movies are interesting, so can trailers be. They're just short. Yeah, I totally don't respect the Dead Island trailer because it wasn't anything that the game was. Yeah, no, I, I think the trailer was selling something entirely different because Dead Island was basically left for dead in a tropical setting. And I, it was Left for Dead meets Condemned. Mm. I, I don't you have gonna, Trailer of the Year on my list, so who won it? I linked you the wiki. Assassin's Creed Revelations, the E3 2011 trailer. It was up against a big list of nominees: Batman: Arkham City, uh, with the Hugo Strange reveal trailer, Dark Souls Ignite 11 debut trailer, Dead Island for the GDC cinematic trailer. Deus Ex Human Revolution for the Purity First Infomercial. Elder Scrolls V Skyrim in-game uh, debut trailer. Hitman Absolution E3 2011 trailer. Prey 2 E3 2011 trailer. Tomb Raider E3 2011 trailer. And Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception E3 2011 trailer. So basically they went, hey, remember E3? Let's just drag everything back from that and use yeah, it as filler I, for our show. I, I gotta say, though, of the entire year worth of game trailers, the one that stuck out the most to me was the Deus Ex cinematic trailer. I think I've shown it to you at least once. Mm-hmm. That actually completely portrayed the movie as a... As a, uh, a or portrayed the game as a movie experience. Mm-hmm. That was fantastic and got me so hyped up for a story that just didn't come. <clears throat> I'm going to bite my tongue at the obvious setup there. Yup. Yeah. So yeah, that's the Spike Awards because we're not talking about who's going to be on the cover of Blitz. I gotta <laughs> complain one more time that there is no Best Screenplay or Best Story Award. Because there should be. Yeah, there, there really needs to be a Best Story Award for the year, mostly so that Bioware can win it. And I also want to mention a game that was done dirty by this list is a Saints Row the Third, which I don't know where I'd put it in any of these awards, but it was super fun and an interesting game that came out this year that was not represented right. at all. Nope. Uh, that's also, I think, a failing in the categories, though. There should be probably, like, a most fun category, Le- and that's I, I what think it could be nominated for. Th- there could be, like, a, a stupid mindless fun category, even, and it would take that. Yeah. Most ridiculously awesome category. It, it'd get that. So, yeah. Next week, we'll be back with more of our patented craziness. Um, let's see. Next week is the official launch of Star Wars The Old Republic. Um. We will not be reviewing it that week. Nope. Because we need way more time. But I think you can already guess what we think about that. So instead, we will be reviewing... Pyro? What's on your list? I don't got nothing. Yeah, we'll have to come back. Oh no, we're going to have to find something. Well, uh, we could play the Humble Bundle games. Yeah, there's So, we're going to we're going to be rampaging to find reviews for next week. If you've got suggestions, you can hit us up on Facebook at facebook.com/nerdtalk. Hey, we've also got something else happening on the Facebook for next week. Another contest. We're giving away a copy of Trine. Trine 1. Yes. The original. The original. Which so you can get yourself set up for number 2. Yeah. They're pretty much the same, so you're not you're not losing out on anything. You get the uh, back of the story. Would you like to go over the rules for this one? This will be done a little bit differently. 
The rules for this one are mostly the same as they were before, which is that you can comment on the Facebook post that we'll put up, or the YouTube video, but there is a special caveat that you have to actually like our Facebook page to win this time. And right. so if we draw your name and we double check and you are not, you have not liked us, then we're giving it to somebody else. Yeah, we don't like people who don't like us. Also, we don't like people who don't like, uh, um... Ice cream? Baked potato soup. That's right. <laughs> we're fans of it. Okay. <laughs> so for Nerd Talk being super serious, this is said. I'm Pixie. And I'm Pyrosim. And we'll catch you next week on Nerd Talk. Or else. <laughs>